little strange not to say open up your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, um, but that's okay. By God's grace, we'll be back there in September. As we have been preparing you for the last couple of weeks, we are beginning a series or a study on biblical stewardship. That's just a roundabout way of saying money. Uh, but since it's such a touchy subject, we want to tread upon it lightly. The leadership saw it fit that we would teach uh, through a series in the summer uh, on money. Um, just because we've seen so many people become Christians in the last couple of years. And unfortunately, this is one of the things that is overlooked often uh, for fear that we will be seen uh, as the money-hungering hucksters that we like to um, mock at times, like Creflo Dollar and Joel Osteen and all those people who want your pockets. But as we're going to see, money is dealt with uh, quite often in the Old Testament and especially in the New Testament. Jesus talked about money more than heaven and hell combined. And though it might make us uncomfortable, we're going to see that there is uh, a link between our faith and our finances. And I honestly think that preaching about money is more convicting uh, than preaching about the sovereignty of God and salvation. How we use our money, all of us would probably say that we don't spend it in a manner worthy of the calling of Christ. But hopefully, by God's grace, this will not be us condemning ourselves, but saying, God, please open up my heart and may my, follow, my wallet follow in the wake of that open heart. In seminary, they told us that we had to be very careful when we preached on money. In fact, in our hermene or in our homiletics class, which is a fancy word for learning how to preach, we had a, a whole class, three hours, set apart for how to preach on it because it can be such an offensive thing and people can leave with such a distaste in their mouth after preaching on it that we need to be very careful and cautious. So just so you know, uh, I am up here kind of trembling. Uh, I really don't want to preach on it, but Paul preached on the whole counsel of God and my guess is that he preached on stewardship because when I look in Philippians 4 and 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, he's thanking the Lord for their gift uh, that he needed to take to Jerusalem and the gift um, that supplied him. I was thinking about it this morning. We were finishing the Gospel of Luke in our family devotions, and Luke is highlighting women in Christ's ministry. And he said something very interesting in the 23rd chapter, or is it the 24th? Anyways, um, he was saying that there were women that took care of his needs. And that Judas had a money bag. What in the world is that for? Turn the bread or the stones into bread. Jesus. No, Jesus' ministry required money. It, it, it seems so unspiritual. Often when we talk about money, we think, oh, unspiritual, worldly. Let's get to the stuff like justification and let's talk about forgiveness. We're going to see some powerful examples of the Gospel of Luke this morning that show us that actually where, uh, to quote Matthew 6, where your treasure is, there's your heart. Giving money doesn't save you. But if you don't give money to others, and especially the gospel, are you saved? That's what Luke would ask. That's what the Holy Spirit would say. Paul says to the Corinthians, We do not want to dominate you by telling you how to put your faith into practice. We want to work together with you so that you're Life will be full of joy. That's the NLT paraphrase. But Paul is telling the people, I don't want to be up here dominating you, telling you how to live your life. He says, rather, I'm writing this letter to you that you might be filled with joy. And so please understand that it's not my motive or the leadership's endeavor to somehow suck you dry of money. I was reading an article by Tim Challies last week about false teachers versus true teachers. And he says, false teachers want your good, goods, sorry, True teachers want your good. And in a message I listened to by John MacArthur, he opened up being very gentle and he said, I want your good, and so I'm going to preach about giving. Because Jesus himself said in Acts 20, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so I hope you see, not just mine, but the leadership's shepherd heart in this, that you really rob yourself when you rob God. 
It, it's true. And so I'll, I'll just start with a personal testimony. When, when times of giving are good, there seems to be a great contentment that God gives my soul. That it's in the times of giving that I actually recognize the gospel is true, but it's in the times when I'm a miser and I'm scrunching and scrunching and the gospel just seems very unreal to me at those times. And I pray that if that's you, that God would give you freedom to give generously. And you think, oh, he just wants your money. I thought of this. If you don't want to give to us, then go to another church and give generously to them. There you go. I don't want your money. I want your good. If you don't want to give us lots of money, go and give another gospel-centered church your money. Go and support another mission that takes the gospel. Do, but be generous. Don't say, well, the pastor's a hypocrite. Well, then go to a non-hypocritical pastor and give your money to a ministry that will use your money well. Okay, so I just wanted to start with that. That I'm not looking for a raise. Uh, I don't have a little thermometer that gauges the giving. And God knows that I've never, ever looked at the books to see how much anyone gives. So if you feel I'm looking at you, I have no idea how much any of you give. So there you go. So don't feel, oh, he must know that I'm not giving, or he must know I'm the big shot. I have no idea. Okay? So please don't feel I'm picking on you if I'm looking at you. God knows, which should frighten you more than me. I'm just a sinner, right? I don't want your money. I don't need your money. God doesn't need your money. Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Psalm 50, he says the same thing. I don't need your bulls. I don't need your sacrifices. The cow on a thousand hills? Mine. I made the earth. It's mine. It's not like God's up there. Oh boy, I don't know if I can complete the Great Commission. Giving's down. God doesn't need our money. But, I was thinking of the book of Proverbs. My son, give me your heart. God wants your heart. And I was thinking about this. God doesn't have your heart if he doesn't have your wallet. It's true. I was thinking of a whole bunch of different titles, but I think a good one would be faith and finances. Because when we don't give, it shows we have little faith in the promises of God. That's the reason why we're so cheap. This is why we, we're like the man in Luke 12, which we'll look at. We're going to build bigger barns. Why do we build bigger barns? Because we don't believe Jesus' words in Matthew 6. See the sparrows? No. Are you not worth more than those? They're sold for a couple of pennies. My father, your father, he's got you covered. God wants your good. We want your good. Further, we want the good of the world. I think I've betrayed it at least to the leadership and hopefully to the church. I don't like to do numbers, but I would lo I want we want to give as much money as possible to missions, local and foreign. And we always say this, that we can only give to missionaries as much as you give. So I want your good. God wants your good. But I want also the good of the world. And I don't know why... Christians don't realize this, but ministry, it actually takes money. I mean, like all the pastors we're supporting in India, do you know they actually have to eat? They have to put clothes on their kids' backs, and they have to pay rent. It's not just this magical aura that goes over them. When we, yes, we're to pray for them, but we should also pray, God, please. I love Psalm 119. Uh, uh, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. It's a good prayer. Incline my heart to your testimonies, which includes giving generously for our good and for the good of this world and ultimately the glory of God. Uh, Cheryl gave me some stats. I'm not going to get into them too much. I think I'm just going to post it on Facebook. It was from the Francis Schaeffer Institute, and they've done a whole bunch of research. But another reason we want to preach through this series is the appalling statistics amongst confessing evangelicals. Yes, evangelicals give... Four times higher than Protestants. But still, it's appalling. The average is 3% giving amongst evangelical born-again Christians. I don't believe in tithing. I believe the New Covenant requires much more than that. But even if we want to start with 10%, we're not even a third of the way there. And we're robbing God. So, I'll put those stats there, but when I read through it, it's quite long. Thank you, Cheryl. It grieved me. 
It grieved me. Jesus says, I'm coming back in Matthew 24. What? When the gospel reaches the four corners of the earth. So my friend Caleb's in Papua New Guinea right now. And he had to raise support to go there. But we send him there because we believe God has people there. And we believe that as the gospel goes there, Christ will come back when every tongue and tribe and nation hears the sweet sound of Christ. But it took Caleb $30,000 to go there. And he didn't buy himself, a whole, he didn't go with a big arsenal of iPads and iPhones and everything. It just cost him that much to get there. And you know why he went? Because he believes in Matthew 24 that Christ says, I will come back when this good news is taken to the four corners of the earth. And so Ralph Winter, let me give you a quote. He was a, a brilliant man, he had degrees in all kinds of fields, and he gave it all up to become a missiologist, to study missions. And he started the, uh, uh, what is it, Center for American Missions in the World or something like that, you can find. But he says this, the U.S. evangelical slogan, pray, give, or go, really means do nothing. So when people come to our church asking for support, we say, well, we'll pray for you, which usually we don't. But what about the give or the go? Very few of us go because we are very comfortable. And very few of us give because we don't want to. He says this, by contrast, the Friends Missionary Prayer Band of South India numbers 8,000 people. Okay, so there's a band of believers in South India numbering 8,000 people. They support 80 full-time missionaries to North India. He says, if my denomination, with its unbelievably greater wealth per person, were to do that well, we would not be sending 500 missionaries, but 26,000. Even if they were making the same amount as the Indians were. If, if, if we have the same values, never mind that we're making probably 15 to 20 times more than them, on their budget, we would be sending 26,000 missionaries instead of 500. In spite of their true poverty, those poor people in South India are sending 50 times as many cross-cultural missionaries as we are. Okay, so that's another reason. Constantly when we get together as elders, we rejoice that we triple our missions budget. But we want to keep doing it. But we can't increase our missions budget unless you, by faith, trust the Lord that He will take that and use it for His good. That's why we're going to have our annual meeting. And hopefully we're being good stewards. We're not trying to hide anything. You're going to see how much I make. Which Marvin always says, that's great. Everyone knows how much the pastor makes, but why don't we ever get to find out how much everyone else makes? But you're going to see that I don't think I'm being overpaid. If I wanted your money, I would have never come here. Really. I worked two jobs when I first came here for the first two and a half years I was here. I can make lots of money elsewhere. So please don't think this is my little pledge-a-thon for a race. But we do want to sponsor more missionaries. We want to do more outreach. We want to see more people's lives changed by the gospel. In the words of Jesus, we want you to use your unrighteous mammon to make friends of eternal or everlasting habitations. We want to use God's money for God's kingdom. God your kingdom come. You know what that looks like practically? God help me to give more for missions. If you don't think we're doing good missions here, again, find a good local church that is doing missions that you think as well. And give sacrificially to them. The one point I want to hammer home then, this morning, as we look at various texts, is this. There's a great joy that comes to us from God the Holy Spirit when we surrender lesser joys for greater joys. Or in the language of Matthew 6, we surrender temporal joys for eternal joys. I want to give us a whole new paradigm, a whole new perspective of how we use money. We buy things. So, you know, we buy iPads and we buy new things because we think it will give us joy. And Jesus wants to say, you can get more joy by laying up for yourself treasure elsewhere. And that's what I want to get. I want you to understand there's great joy. And oh, what joy we forfeit when we miss this principle. There's a great joy in surrendering lesser treasures to gain greater eternal treasures. That's, that's the one principle. If you fall asleep, I want to show you that God blesses those who sacrificially give now for the future.
text. Matthew 13, 44. This is not where we're going to linger. But Jesus is talking in Matthew 13. He's giving seven parables or seven pictures of what the kingdom of God is like. And we know uh, all too well the parable of the soils, or as my Bible heads it, um, the parable of uh, the seeds. And then he moves on to the parable of the weeds. He talks about all kinds of things like gnats. But in, in one verse, uh, verse 44, he likens the kingdom of heaven to a treasure. And I think it articulates well uh, this point. By the way, I don't want to plagiar, or I am plagiarizing, I guess. I'm using a lot of Randy Alcorn's material. It's a little book called The Treasure Principle. I am unreservedly, uh, unashamedly, unapologetically borrowing from him. I don't need to reinvent the will. He did a very good job. And so if you own the book and you think that I'm basically rehashing what he says, I am. Hopefully, you know, not just being lazy. I have, I'm reading five books on it, but his, his was fantastic. If you can purchase it, The Treasure Principle, you can read it like that. It's just a tiny little book. You can read it in a couple days. Or if you're a voracious reader, in an hour probably. But Matthew 13, 44, let me read it. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now remember, a parable has one ultimate point. It's, and I don't want us to over allegorize this and say, oh, you got to buy your way into the kingdom. Or it's good to wrong people. So no, that's not what Jesus is saying. His main point is that there is something that is unestimably, unestimably valuable that this man is willing to trade everything on earth for. He is willing to deny himself of temporal graciation for something in the future that will bring him greater reward. I think that's the principle he's saying here. The kingdom has come in Christ and you've stumbled upon it. Oh, how foolish you would be to forsake the great treasure of the kingdom with Christ as the king for this kingdom. But I don't think that this is just a, a principle that points to our initial salvation. Rather, I think this is a parable that is telling us what kingdom life is about. The treasure is not so much Christ as it is the kingdom of God. Now, I'm not blasphemy because Christ is the king in the kingdom of God, right? He says, now you know the kingdom of God is in your midst because I'm standing here. Okay, so I, Christ is the treasure, but in this parable, he's talking about the kingdom and how we live in the kingdom. And so I don't think it's like, okay, deny everything so you can get saved. Trade everything you can so you can trust in Christ. Turn from all of your idols and trust in Christ. That's true. If you want to get saved this morning, you need to lay aside all of your idols of wealth. If you love money, you cannot be saved if you love it more than Christ. You cannot serve two masters, God and man. Okay, so this is what salvation looks like. But I believe Matthew 13, 44 is what it looks like to continue to walk. Where we continue to lay aside lesser treasures for greater treasures. This is how kingdom people live in the kingdom. We have these kingdom values. Okay? Context. Jesus is telling us what it looks like to be a Christian. How to become a Christian, but also how to live as a Christian. The kingdom of heaven revealed in Christ is worth far more than any sacrifice that we would ever be willing to make to acquire it. Do you want more Christ? Do you want more of the greater treasure? Jesus says that you can only have one of the two treasures. You can have the one hidden in the field, which is the kingdom of God in greater measure, or your own kingdom treasure in this world. We should have testimonies sometime, but I've seen people who've lived according to this, and they felt, yes, when I freely say, this is not my money anymore, but it's God's, and I'm but a mere steward, and I give lavishly and generously to others, it seems that I'm getting more of the kingdom. And that more of Christ is filling my heart. How is this connected to money? Well, Jesus is using this as well as many other parables to show us the link between our spirituality and our possessions. Think about what this man did. I always think like what his wife thought. You know, it's like, say, oh, I was going for a walk today. I was, you know, doing my scripture memory, trying to memorize Ephesians 5.10 you know, for the pastor, and I decided to take a shortcut. I wanted to go to the stream and just meditate there, and 
And then I was walking, I kind of tripped over something. And as I investigated a little more, I opened up this box and I realized it's full of rubies and treasure and theological books and stuff like that. <laughs> and you know what I want to do? I want to sell the farm. I want to sell all of our oxen. I want to sell the new car we just got. I want to sell everything. Are you crazy? I've seen how valuable it is. You're just going to have to trust me. The wife doesn't know that this treasure chest is worth probably a hundred times more. But he's like, this is so glorious. I'm willing to give everything up in this present life for this. Notice how it says, then in his joy. Don't miss it. Sometimes we think that giving is this begrudging, uh, forceful thing, you know, that, that we just do out of guilt. It should never be that way. When I read 2 Corinthians 8 last night, it talks about joy as well with giving. God loves a joyful and a generous giver. So this man, is he can't contain himself. He goes home and he's telling his wife, I'll never believe it. we got to sell everything. And she says, okay, if this treasure truly is worth more than all that we have, we would be foolish to keep what we have to forfeit what we could get. Well, let me give you the words of a famous missionary named Jim Elliot. Anyone ever heard of him? Died. He was a brilliant scholar, by the way. If you read his diaries, he uses Greek and Hebrew all the time. The guy was brilliant. And he died very early. And he said this, he is no fool. Anyone know it? He is no fool to lose what he cannot keep, to gain what he cannot lose. That, that's the treasure principle here in this passage here. His wife would say, we're stupid. What if someone else finds this? We've got to do this. Yes, yes, yes. This is glorious. Let's give up everything for this. And Jesus is saying that this is the kingdom of God. Not just about salvation, but this should be how we endeavor to live. I struggle with this. But hopefully this verse will continually convict us. Then it is joy. He traded everything he could to buy up shares of this land so he could buy it and thus get the treasure. Why would Jesus put such an emphasis on money and possessions, right? If, if I say that 15% of Jesus' teachings, a tithe and a half, was on money, we would say that's important. Like if Jesus taught 10 times, at least two of those times he would be speaking about money. So obviously it's important to him. What, what's the link? Why does Jesus talk about money? Didn't he come to save us? Didn't the Son of Man come to seek and to save the lost? Come on, Jesus. Enough of this materialism. Get to the gospel. Show me how I can be saved. Oh, he will. But he wants to show us that there is a fundamental connection between our spiritual lives and how we think about and handle money. I've heard it said this, and I believe it. If you want to show someone your spirituality, give them your credit card bill. I'll quote scripture till the cows come home. But you want to see how spiritual your pastor is? Look at what I'm spending my money on. Scary stuff. There's a fundamental connection between our spiritual lives and how we think about and handle money. J. Vernon McGee, I don't know if you ever heard of him, he's that Texan, he's passed through the Bible. Boy, I love his voice. But he said there are three books that are inseparable for the Christian. Anybody know what three books they are? The book, the hymn book, and the checkbook. We use online paper. Back then, check, I don't know kids, checks are a piece of paper. And you write words on them, how much money you want to give. Anyways, there's three books that are inseparably linked in, in the Christian walk. I want to give you a couple of positive examples of how uh, the use of money shows someone has been saved. And I want to show you some negative examples in the Bible <coughs> that show how they use their money show they weren't saved. You're not saved by money, but if you're saved, it changes everything, including how you use money. Okay, you can't just get saved and have money over here and Bible reading here and church attendance here and training up kids here. No, 
It's a fabric, it's a mosaic, it's, everything's intertwined. You can't separate the sacred and the secular. How you use your money is extremely spiritual. Every time you buy something, a spiritual transaction is taking place. Okay, so let's look at a couple of positive examples. Turn to Luke 3 quick. I'm not going to exegete this. You're just going to have to trust that I've looked at the context and I'm not uh, bringing something out uh, that isn't there. But you remember Luke's elaborating a little more than Matthew when John comes preaching the kingdom. He's preparing the way, uh, uh, in the words of Malachi and Isaiah, for the coming of Christ. Uh, and in, in Luke chapter 3, he starts preaching. And he's preaching about repentance. And then look in verse 10. They're saying, well, what, what should we do here? You tell us that we, we need to show fruits of repentance. And it's going to be interesting that the three fruits that Luke gives us here, all three fruits of repentance, all three fruits of genuine conversion, John the Baptist says have to do with money. He doesn't say, now quote for me the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Tell me the five points. Give me your scripture memory. Tell me something that will amaze me. Tell me you've read the Institutes. That's not what he says. He says, I want to see how you use your money. It's interesting, all three. What shall we do? And he answered, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Share your resources. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what should we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusations, and be content with your wages. John is saying, How you view money and use it has to do with where your heart's at. For where your treasure is there, your heart is also. Let's also look in Luke 19. Luke has lots to say about money, by the way. If you want to read a little bit more, you're just going to have to trust me. Bum, bum, bum. Jesus and Zacchaeus. The wee little man, little wee little man was he. I never learned that song until two years ago when Christina was teaching it to the kids. And now I can't get it out of my head. <laughs> but what is, what is the fruit of Zacchaeus and repentance? Remember, Jesus says, here is a child of Abraham. Salvation has visited this man's house. What is the fruit by which Jesus makes that proclamation? He says, here, Lord, what I have wronged, I'm restoring. And not just giving them, I'm going to give it to them. I forget, I should have read it again. Twofold or fivefold, somefold. He gives, he, he not only restores, but he gives back more than he took. And she says, wow, look at the way he's using money, which used to control him. How do I know the shackles of covetousness have been broken? How do I know that his greed, which is idolatry, is now gone? How do I know he's ready to serve Christ, or he's ready to serve the Messiah and not mammon? Look at how he uses his money. This is a great litmus test. A lot of people who are very knowledgeable and yet still love money. I love it in Luke when Jesus is telling the parables and Luke puts in a bracket. Now the Pharisees who loved money didn't like what Jesus was saying. They understood that these parables Jesus was telling about money was convicting them. The most religious people in the world. If we line them all up here, you say, those ten are going to heaven. Look at how much scripture they know. They've got little flatteries going on. They tie them. They're covetous and they love money. Acts chapter 2 and 4. Don't turn there. But what happens when they get saved? We don't think it's our money anymore. It's God's money. Do I need to sell a field? I'll sell it. I'm not talking about communism. I'm not a socialist. <laughs> I'm a capitalist through and through. You know, I think it's biblical. But when push comes to shove, what does Barnabas do? The son of encouragement. Oh, someone's need. Here, he lays it at the apostles' feet. How do you know that Barnabas is, I'm using my money for something that is of far greater use. I really don't need, you know, that, that, that new robe. Man, that's, those sandals, awesome. I can really use them. Someone needs to eat. Okay. 
And so I've given you four examples, Acts 2, Acts 4, uh, Luke uh, 3, Luke 19. Let's look at some negative examples, okay? So positively, how people use their money shows they're safe, okay? It doesn't save them, but how you use your money is linked with where your heart is at. Okay, let's look at some negative ones in Luke 12. It's the story of the man who wanted to build bigger barns. Remember? I know what I'll do. Oh man, it's bumper year. Sweet, I'm going to put some more in investments. Or, you know, the iPhone 5 is out. Yeah, the iPhone 4. I'm getting kind of old, kind of so 2012. I'm going to build, I'm, I'm going to do, I, I'm me. I'm going to use this money on me. You guys want the iPhone 5? I hope I haven't convicted you. Well, I hope I have. Just get a little junker like me. Does all you need. Gives you more time to memorize scripture too. Um, Luke 12. So this man builds bigger barns. So thou hast done well for thyself. And then he hears a knock on the door. And it's divine omnipotence calling on him. These should be convicting words. What does he say to the man? Thou fool. Why is he a fool? You're rich, but in all the wrong ways. You're not rich towards God. There's a lot of people sitting in churches that we like, this guy is the man. But are you rich towards God? This is the convicting stuff. So this is going to betray. When we were trying to get together with the other church, I'm a big mouth and I always seem to be the fool of Proverbs who invites a beating. But anyways, they're asking me about tithing. This was a gong show. They weren't asking me about my theology of salvation or anything. Just like the dumbest things they were asking me. They're pet, pet hobby horses. And I said something that enraged a guy. I just have that. That's my spiritual gift. <laughs> and this man was a very well-to-do man. And I said, tithing is wrong in the New Covenant. I said, a doctor giving $50,000 when he makes $500,000? I said, that's wicked. That's mocking God. You're telling me that doctor needs $450,000 to live on? And he can do this to God? Hey, I give you my tithe, God. You really think the look? And this man made a lot. And I was basically saying to him, your 10% is an insult to God. And it is. Pharisees can give that. But God commends as the widow who gives two pennies. Anyways, that's the sign. Where your heart is at. How much do you want to give it up just so people know, just to get God off your back? Or do you want to give over the overflow of a regenerated heart? God, here I am. Here's an expression. Here I am. Take as much as you need. Luke 12, foolish. Do you think this man went to heaven based on the context? So he dies, and God says, thou fool. Okay, come up to heaven anyways. No, it shows this man was unregenerate. How? How he used his money on himself and not for kingdom purposes. The idol of self shows that this man wasn't saved. Uh, Luke, I want to say 16, Mr. Dives, and it's not because he likes to swim, it's the old Latin word for rich man. Remember Lazarus sitting outside the rich man's gates? He's begging for food. The rich man had no pity on him. It showed this rich man was not a believer. He who had everything, who fared sumptuously, I think the King James says. Here's a man in need, Matthew 25. You might give him a cup of cold water, for goodness sake. This rich man might have been going to the synagogue every Sabbath. Might have been a well-to-do religious junkie. Dogs licking up Lazarus. So, so the story progresses on. What happens? They both die. Now, does the rich man go as it were to torment? Because he can, you know, he goes there because he's unregenerate. How do we know he's unregenerate? Look at how he uses his money. I'm not saying you buy your way into the kingdom, but if you're in the kingdom, how you use your money. It's radically different. Okay, you can read the details more, but you should be familiar enough uh, with that story. Last one, it's not Luke uh, in its entirety, so go to Matthew 19. It's the parable of the rich young ruler. Okay? 
You should be familiar with this as well. Remember, here's a good moral man. He'd be on most deacon boards, by the way. Here's a seeker. He wants to be saved, apparently. What must I do? Tell me, Jesus, I want to be saved. Okay, I'm a good person. I've kept those commands from my youth up. I'm a good, I got it going together. I'm rich. What does Jesus do? He says, ah, here's the litmus test. We're going to see if you really want to get saved. We want to see who's, which God you want to serve. Do you want to serve the Messiah or do you want to serve the mammon? I was thinking about this. Our churches are filled with lots of good people who worship money more than Christ. And this is a scary parable. What you need to do? Go and sell everything you have. And not only that, don't go and sell it and invest it. Go and give it to people who need it. Then you will have true treasure. Then you will have true life. What was his response? The seeker. Most churches would have had him say the sinner's prayer, baptize him next Sunday, done. Jesus let him go his way. This man was not a worshiper of God. He wanted religion that made him look good in society. Religion makes us look good. I give 10% so people think I'm a well, uh, a good citizen. Jesus is getting to the heart of the issue, isn't he? When Paul says that greed is idolatry, he's right. Okay, so I've given you some positive examples to show how do you use your money. Do you give Jesus lip service? Are you hearers of the word? Are you doers of the word? How do you know that, that these people are saved? How do they use their money? How do you know they're not saved? How do they use your money? Let me ask you, how do you use your money? And I don't want to say, oh, mama. mama. But if you never use your money for kingdom purposes, are you saved? Quit being so negative, Pastor. You say these things. That you might repent and be saved. Do you think I care about tickling ears? I actually believe in a heaven and a hell. Is the man in Matthew 13 smart or stupid in light of those examples I've given you? Is the man in Matthew 13 smart or stupid? The man in Luke 12 is stupid. The man in Matthew 19, the rich and ruler, he's stupid. Why? Because they weren't willing to give up temporal treasures for eternal treasures. They forfeited the true joy of delaying temporal desires for eternal desires. Or in the language of Matthew 6, they're foolish because they spend all of their time, all of their toil, laying up for themselves treasures on earth. I love Apple products, but I know that this thing that I'm preaching out of is going to be obsolete soon. No, it might not rust, but Jesus' principle is still true. It's not going to serve me forever. I'm not going to have an iPad in heaven. Right? Praise app, or the whatever app, the gardening app. No, this, this is a tool, but it's not eternal. Cars, houses, even your education, not eternal. How foolish we are as investors when we forsake eternal rewards for temporal pleasures. Do you feel sorry for the man in Matthew 13? Do you feel sorry for him? You fool! You delay your gratification for the future? You fool. God doesn't say thou fool. He says it to the man in Luke 12. But the man in Luke, or Matthew 13 is seen as wise. Why? Because this traveler understood what his loss would gain him. This is why it's by faith. I'll preach to the cows come home. You'll quote this verse to the cows come home. Unless you believe with this man that eternal treasure and eternal joy await those who forsake temporal gratification, you have to believe it. If you don't believe this, you're never going to do it. That's why we don't invest in eternity, because we're of such little faith. That's why I don't. I can see something physical. I can use it now. But that doesn't take faith. That just takes senses. The sense of touch or smell or whatever. 
But God wants us to exercise the sense of faith. He wants us to walk by faith, not by sight. This is why God is glorified by our faith. Abraham, he gave up everything. Romans 4, why? Hebrews 11, why? He believed God's promise. Live. But then I got everything here. Leave to the place I'm going to show you. Can you at least give me a Google map? Trust me, Abraham. I'm good. I will give you more than you can ever dream of. Trust me. And Abraham trusted him. And he was reckoned to him as his righteousness. You think that's just salvation? That's the Christian walk. Taking God at his word and believing him and honoring him by faith. Abraham, no distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but rather he grew strong in his faith, giving glory to God. That's Romans 4. God's word will not return to him void, Isaiah 55. He's not man that he should lie. When God says, you will be blessed if you give, do you believe it? Do I believe it? I'm not looking down my nose because I struggle with this. But oh, if our church would get, tis more blessed to give than receive. How do I know we believe it? We'll be giving church. No, no, I just quote it to you. We're not to feel sorry for the traveler in Matthew 13. We're not to pity him. We're to imitate him. This man did it in his joy. He wasn't exchanging lesser treasures for greater treasures. He wasn't exchanging greater treasures for lesser treasures, sorry. He was exchanging something temporal and small and minute in, compa in comparison to something that was grounded in glorious and eternal. That's how we should be using our money today. The traveler made short-term sacrifices to obtain a long-term reward. Giving is sacrificial, I know that. A lot, look at my Amazon wish list for good night. Like, I would love to have all those books. I'd love to have a way better guitar. I'd love, you hear how our van sounds when we drive it? <coughs> like, of course I would want all those things. That's okay. Am I willing to drive that so I can give more money to missionaries? Yeah. I'd be stupid not to. Our sacrifice pales in comparison to the award that, reward that awaits us. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God's bank account is tighter than the Swiss bank account? That his treasury in heaven, you can't break in, and it accrues at a much greater interest anyways. That's what Paul says in Philippians 4. I don't need your fruit. Rather, I want the accruing of your gift. That's what he says. It's a counting term in, in Philippians 4. They gave you money. Paul says, I don't want it. What I'm rejoicing is that you're laying out for yourself treasures in heaven. You may never taste of them on the side of heaven, but you will get them. As sure as God is God, you will get them. It is foolish then to grasp and to clasp after all the things of this world and use them on ourselves rather than the kingdom. In the parable of Matthew 13, then Jesus compares and contrasts what we do value, temporary, earthly treasure, with what we should value. Okay, please don't miss that. He's showing you, this is what you do value, here's what you should value, and that's all I'm asking. This is what we should be valuing. And if you don't, say, God, incline my heart to thy testimonies and not to selfish gain. He'll answer that prayer. <clears throat> Solomon in Proverbs 23 says that don't flit literally on flittering wealth. What happens if you set your affection and your gaze upon money? It grows wings and flies away. And in Alcorn's book he said, now imagine the new car you bought or the TV you bought or whatever. Just imagine it growing wings because eventually it is going to fly away. You're not taking it with you to heaven. There's no U-Hauls behind purses. That new thing you just needed to have, it's going to grow wings. It will fly away from you, either when it breaks down or when you die. Be very careful. John Rockefeller, one of the wealthiest men who ever lived, after he died, someone asked his accountant, they say, so how much did old John D. leave behind? Guess what the answer was? All of it. 
Thus those who use their money to live for the now are deemed by Jesus and Scripture as foolish. But those who use their money and possessions for eternity are deemed wise. I think that's what we want as leadership. We want to see you walking in wisdom. Treasure principle. I get this from Randy Alcorn and we'll close with that. He says this. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. And he uses the brilliant example uh, in the Civil War. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it other than my in-laws. Um, but you had the Northerners uh, against the Southerners. And everyone knew that the North was eventually going to win. And so he said, just imagine that, that you're a Northerner and for some reason you're in the South and you've accrued for yourself a lot of Confederate money. But you know that soon the North is going to, as it were, set up its kingdom. It's going to conquer the Confederacy. The southern kingdom is going to lose. What are you going to do with that money? He says, if you're wise, you're going to invest that Confederate money into U.S. money so that you can use it in the future. You can't use it. Once the North takes over, that Confederate money is worthless. And he says, that is how we should see our earthly money. When Christ calls us home, all those savings accounts that we have, nothing. And so what he says is what you should be doing is using your Confederate money for the kingdom that's to come. Use our earthly treasures to lay out for ourselves heavenly treasures, which moth and rust cannot destroy, nor can a thief break in and steal. Financial planners say that if you're planning, plan not three weeks or three months, but at least three years ahead. Jesus is saying, plan eternity in hand. Don't just be thinking about your retirement. Be thinking about your eternal habitations. It's good to plan for retirement, but there's a better investment that awaits you. I love John Wesley. Save much. Make much. Save much. Give much. Why? He understood. Good interest rates. John Piper says this. Jesus is not against investment. He's against bad investment. Okay? And so what I want us to do is to go home and there's nothing unspiritual looking at our finances. Have I been investing wisely? Okay, and if you think I'm after your money, I encourage you, go to another church and give all your money to them. I really don't, uh, like Paul, I'm after this eternal fruit. Every day then, we should see as an opportunity to buy up more shares in Christ's eternal kingdom. Do you see that? When I read that in Elkhart, it blew my mind. Every time I can say, here's an opportunity to lay up treasures here or to lay up treasures here. Okay, I'm not saying that, you know, start starving yourself. Yeah, get enough to get by. But over and above that, invest wisely. This is a revolutionary concept, but if we embrace it, it will change our lives. I've seen people who are generous. It seems like the Lord is just all over their lives. I read about in the Proverbs, the chintzy man, he eventually comes to ruin. The one who waters will himself be watered, Proverbs 22 somewhere says that. So let me give you a conclusion. As I was doing this, I'm like, wait a minute, what if there's unbelievers? So he's always talking about money. How can someone get saved in this? Right? Can someone get saved about the, you know, I've talked about money, but I'm worried about sins. I think there's a trajectory. And we're saved by faith. And when I'm talking about how we should use our money, we're to use our money by faith. I can't see all the investments that I've made in eternity, except but by faith. So if you want to get saved, what you need to do is you need to believe God's promise that He as we read in Isaiah 30, magnifies himself to show you mercy. And he will receive you. The soul that comes to Jesus, he will never cast away. That he will receive filthy, rotten, covetous, greedy idolaters. And he will wash them and cleanse them and sanctify them. He will make them his children through adoption in Christ. If you believe God's gracious promise of salvation, the Bible says you will be saved. This is the hymn we sing. The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus, 
a pardon or forgiveness receives. That's the gospel, isn't it? That's how, we, that's how we enter the kingdom. We enter the kingdom by trusting in God's promise. I can't see the promise, but I'm glorifying you by taking you at your word. You are trustworthy, and so I'm going to trust you. I honor you as trustworthy. You're glorified when I trust in you by faith, Romans 4. That's how you get saved. But if you are saved, Lord, I trust you. I can't see my eternal riches. But just like the day I trust you for salvation, I trust you that you are good and your words will not return void. And so I spend my money accordingly. We walk by faith. We're not just saved by faith. We walk by faith. The gospel is the power of God for deliverance, for salvation every day, not just from our sins, but from those proclivities in our hearts to tend to spend on ourselves. It's the same faith. The same God who offers the same promise says, believe me, and you will be saved. Believe me with the promise of money. So what is the principle? Trust God. Take him at his word. Forfeit these temporal, puny uh, uh, pro uh, promises of joy for eternal ones. You know how Satan loves to work? You need this now. You need this now. You need it now. You need it yesterday. And God says, walk by faith. Use your money as a currency of faith. Express your faith in me by how you use your money. And that's why Jesus can link faith and use of money together. Okay, so I know this was maybe a little bit of a spank, but you know what? We spend money every day. And I pray to God you would spend it wisely. You would support missionaries, compassion children, and feed the poor. Say, here church, here's money. Let's use this and do an outreach this summer. I love to do more outreach. Let's pray. Father, it's way long. I don't know what. Yeah. I just trust you, Lord. I want this to be way shorter. I just pray that the principle would still be hammered home, Lord. That in great joy, this man gave up everything for the now. That he might enjoy something in the future. The joy came from faith. If he didn't believe the treasure was worth anything, if he didn't believe it would cash out in the future, he would have never done it. So Lord, help us to believe that we can lay out for ourselves treasures in heaven. There's a million things I want today. But Lord, help me by faith to trust you and to invest in your eternal kingdom. Oh Lord, give us a heart of wisdom. Even as Moses asked in Psalm 90. And we might know our end and understand that we're just passing through. We're just pilgrims, strangers, and sojourners. And our citizenship is in heaven. So help us to spend our money as heavenly citizens, Lord, I ask. I need grace for this, and I know everyone in this room needs grace for it. Father, if we have been idolaters and covetous, Grant us the gift of repentance. Let us return to you. And say, Lord, forgive. Lord, restore. Now, Lord, enable me to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which I've been called. Lord, be glorified. We thank you for this beautiful long weekend. Father, please level out the message I've just preached with balance. May people understand that I'm not calling forth and that they... Uh, live in the slums now. But Lord, give them biblical wisdom. Give them that balance that comes from Scripture. And they and I would use our money wisely. We ask this in Jesus' name.